All right. First thing, I uh, just started a little bit early today because I want to mention to you guys, I just got information about the uh, SI session. SI, called Supplement Instruction, has been renamed to Peer Assisted Learning System, which is called PALS now. And for Calculus 2, uh, you have your basically your study sessions. Just going to give you the location of these uh, the PALS SI sessions that are. Um, we have it on Monday from 11:15 uh, to 12:15. That's in Macy uh, uh, 201. Well, that's actually during our class, so uh, forget it. <laughs> so uh, Tuesday from 11:30 uh, until 12:30. That's in Fretwell 120. On Wednesdays from 4 to 5 in Macy 201. And on Thursdays from 11.30 to 12.30 in Fretwell 120. So uh, make sure, well, I am videotaping this, but uh, make sure that you get this location because this is SI. So if you need some extra help and want, want some, uh, uh, some, some extra looking at your particular Calculus 2 material, this is a great thing to do. Uh, SI, I cannot... Uh, stress how important that is. It's a great way just to reinforce what you know and a good place to go to ask questions about what you don't know. So uh, please uh, pay attention to your peers' uh, schedule and stuff. Um, Today is an important day because we're going into uh, evaluation of integrals. And we're using that stuff that we learned in Chapter 4.9 out of your textbook. And hopefully you already watched the pre-section video on this stuff and have taken the quiz on it because uh, I know it's still drop bad. I think today's the last day of it and stuff, but very soon all this stuff's going to close out on you so you cannot procrastinate on this particular material. So we're talking about going back and uh, doing uh, integration again, and this is a direct connection to what we did in Calculus 1, the last section of 4.9. But I did want to look over the algebra part of this stuff. And... Um, very quickly, this is just the algebra you need to know. And the big deal is cleaning up stuff. And that's going to be the trick to uh, calculus two uh, integration is clean it up first. So in terms of, don't forget your exponential notation of b to the n is b n times, and an example there. And don't forget your uh, rules of exponents. Power, uh, when you like bases, when you multiply, you act, uh, add exponents. When you divide uh, like bases, with uh, exponents, you subtract exponents. Um, anything to zero power is one. One over x to the b, same thing as x to the negative b. So negative exponents go where they're not. If they're on the negative exponent on the bottom, goes to the top. Uh, negative exponent puts stuff on the bottom. Power to a power, you multiply your exponents. And through strict multiplication or division, you get to distribute your powers. So just to do a little review with you guys in terms of the algebra we're doing in this section, x cubed to the fifth power, that's going to be the same power to a power multiply. That will be x to the 3 times 5, or better yet, x to the 15th. Stuff on the bottom, you don't like things on the bottom, so I'm going to clean that up. Constants stay where they're at. That will be 2x to the negative 3, negative exponent. When you multiply, you multiply your constants. 2x to the 4th times 7x cubed is going to be uh, 2 times 7 is 14. X to the fourth times X cubed, multiply your add exponents. Four plus three is uh, seven, so it's 14 X to the seventh. But one of the other things that you guys need to know in terms of cleaning stuff up is stuff like E to the X plus one. And we want to clean this stuff up. We want to analyze it from an E to the X perspective. Well, if you can multiply your add exponents, you can also go in reverse. So E to the X plus one is the same thing as E to the X times E to the first or e to the first is e, so that's e to the x times e. And sometimes that's a better look for your problem to be able to do whatever you need to do to that problem. And another one would be, what about this e3 uh, to the 2x? Well, a power to a power you multiply, so e3 to the 2x, same thing as 3 squared to the x, and 3 squared is 9, so that's the same thing as 9 to the x power. Just a little algebra that we'll be using in this particular section. Okay. Also, the same idea when it comes to cleaning it up, the idea of radicals. Remember, a radical is a fraction of a power. So uh, if I've got, uh, you know, the square root of x is x to the 1 half. But with radicals, strict multiplication division, you can break them up. So if it's the square root of x times y squared of x times square root of y, or square root of x divided by y square root of x divided by square root of y. A, uh, the nth root of x to the m is the same thing as x to the m over m power because the nth root, a, a radical, is a fraction of a power. 
So over here, and um, so if I have something like the uh, x root of uh, n the same, uh, equals y, the same thing as y to the n equals x, it's also the same thing as y is equal to x to the 1 over n power. And so when you have y equals x to the 1 over n power, a radical is a fractional exponent. You get the nth root of x to the m is the same thing as x to the m over n. And, of course, a negative exponent goes where it's not. So if you've got a negative exponent, you put them on the bottom. And when you have a uh, radical, you can write it as a radical or a fractional power. Just a little review on radicals there. So, and, and, the, and the type of stuff that we'll be using, uh, we like powers because we're going to be using those, what we call the power rule for integration stuff that we covered uh, in Calculus 1. But I don't do square roots. So x, the square root of x is the same thing as x to the 1 half power. The seventh root of x to the fifth would be the same thing as x to the 5 sevenths power. Your power stays there, but remember a radical is a fraction of a power, so that's where it shows up as the 5 over 7, the sevenths part. Cleaning this thing up, this is 3x squared plus 7x divided by, I don't do square roots, a square root is x to the 1 half power, but in terms of cleaning it up, because I have a single denominator, this is 3x squared over x to the half plus 7x over x to the half, and then I back to division with like bases, I subtract exponents. So this is 3x to the 2 minus a half is 1 and a half or 3 halves, plus 7x to the first divided by x to the half. When you divide, subtract x minus 1 minus a half is a half. And this is going to look a lot better from a calculus perspective to do our calculus antiderivative stuff on. Another aspect of, of things that you need to know in terms of algebra is the idea of uh, polynomial expansion, a.k.a. fulling it out. So if I have a plus b times c plus d, pulling it out, that's a times c plus a times d plus b times c plus b times d. So an example of that, if I'm doing some calculus on uh, 2x plus 3 times x minus 1, and whether that calculus be derivatives or integration, you want to clean them up first. So cleaning them up first would be 2x times x, which is 2x squared, 2x times minus 1, which is minus 2x, 3 times x is plus 3x, and 3 times minus 1 is minus 3, and then, of course, combine like terms. This will be 2x squared minus x plus 3x is plus x minus 3. So this is the algebra in this section that you'll be using a lot of. Now, here is section 5.3 at its best. Now, we reviewed a little bit of this, again, back in Chapter 4.9. This is the integral means antiderivative. And so, one of our big rules is this. When we take the antiderivative of the derivative function with respect to x, that's what the dx stands for, you get the original function back up to a constant, plus c. Because with this stuff, we don't have any bounds on our integration. So the integral of a derivative dx is equal to the original function. This integral means antiderivative. The antiderivative of the derivative, the anti and the derivative cancel, and you get the original function back plus c. But if you th also think about what we did in calculus one when we took the antiderivative, when we first introduced this concept, every time you integrate or take an antiderivative, you make the function bigger. And because of that, we also have this interesting notation that the integral of little f of x dx is equal to big f of x plus c. This is a formula that we talk about, calculate big F of x. That means take the antiderivative of somebody. So big F of x is equal to the antiderivative of little f of x. When you integrate a little letter, you get a big letter, plus c. Now this is the, uh, one of the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, formulas. There are two of them. We've got a whole section on that, and that will come section 5.4. I hope you get there today. The fundamental theorem of calculus big formula is this. When I integrate, a function with bounds from a to b of f of x dx. You're going to get the antiderivative. That will be big f of x using this notation. But you don't need to put the plus c on it because you got bounds. And these bounds are going to go back here in the back from a to b. And according to this fundamental theorem of calculus, once you take the antiderivative, you plug in the top bound minus plug in the bottom bound. So you end up getting big f of b minus big f of a. And the reason for this is, now, what happened to the plus c? Well, if you put the plus c here and you got plus c and then you got a minus 
a plus C, which means minus C, the C's cancel. So there's no reason to write the C at all. You take the antiderivative function with, over the bounds, and you write it with this bracket that lets the mathematician know that you've integrated it, and then you evaluate, plug in top minus plug in bottom, and when you plug in a number into a function, it's going to give you a number. And this number is going to represent this quote-unquote area under the curve, between the curve back to the x-axis. So we don't have to do all this interesting Riemann sum stuff. We can do antiderivatives. So, and again, just noting the definition, the de different names of stuff, a integral with bounds is called a definite integral. An integral without bounds is called an indefinite integral. So terminology. In a mathematics, when you talk about a definite integral, you're going to have an integral with bounds. And you would read this, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. An integral without bounds is called an indefinite integral. You just say the integral of f of x dx. And the other thing I want to remind you of is these are the formulas that you were supposed to have memorized. And I'm going to add to the list here, but these were the uh, formulas from chapter 4.9 from Calculus 1. And it was the last thing we covered in Calculus 1, and now we're in Chapter 5, so there is this continuation aspect of this stuff. Now, there's some other formulas I want to add to this list, and the first one is this. When you integrate a constant k dx with respect to x, the formula for integrating a constant is a constant times the variable x and plus c. And this dx is telling you what the variable is. So if I come over here and did this, What's the integral of 7 dt? That d thing tells you what the variable is. What's the answer going to be? 7, but it's not x. What's the variable in this one? t plus c. That d guy is going to let you know what the variable is. Now, usually with most functions, the variable is kind of sticking in your face. Uh, the integral of e to the x dx is e to the x plus c. The famous, this is called the power rule, the integral of x to any n power, uh, dx is equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c, provided n was not equal to negative 1, because that's a special rule over here. But when you integrate x to a power for any power except negative 1, you add 1 over add 1. Okay? So it's pretty obvious the variable is x. But when I get you guys in the calculus 3, we're going to do multivariable integration and multivariable derivatives. So with this multivariable integration, I got x, y's, and z's, and maybe a few other letters. And I'm trying to integrate, I got to focus on a particular variable. This, this dx stuff tells me what the variable I need to focus on. So we're setting you up for future techniques as well. All right? And so your basic rules are, this is your power rule. This is the famous integral of 1 over x dx is that natural log absolute value of x plus c. The famous integral e to the x dx is e to the x plus c. The integral of a to the x dx is equal to a to the x divided by the natural log of a plus c. It's still an exponential, but if you don't have that magic number e, 2.718, you, and you've got some other base like integral of 2 to the x, you're going to have a dx. You're going to equal 2 to the x divided by the natural log of 2 plus c. Divided by the natural log of a is the adjusting factor for not having the e in the problem. And, of course, you've got to know your trig stuff here. The integral of sine of x dx is equal to negative cosine of x plus c. The integral of cosine of x dx is sine of x plus c. The integral of the secant squared of x dx is tangent of x plus c. The integral of cosecant squared of x dx is negative cotangent of x plus c. The integral of secant of x times tangent of x dx is secant of x plus c. And the integral of cosecant of x times cotangent of x dx is negative cosecant of x plus c. And then you had three. Oh, we focus on this three. We wrote down two for you, so I'm going to write down one more over here, number 13. The antiderivative, I mean, excuse me, the uh, inverse trig derivative formulas, antiderivative formulas here, inverse trig. The integral of 1 over x squared plus 1 dx is uh, arc tangent or tangent inverse of x plus c. The integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx is the sine inverse of x plus c. And number 13 down here is this, the other one. The integral of 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1 dx is equal to the arc secant of x plus c, also known as the secant inverse of x plus c. There was one more you needed to know in terms of this list. So, and if you add this one up here, that's a grand total of 14 basic formulas you need to have memorized. 
Now, typically, uh, if you had me for your professor in Calculus 1, I told you some of the tricks on memorization. I have the derivative memorized, and therefore, I can get the antiderivatives in reverse. Because since the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, the integral of sine of x is going to be negative cosine of x. This is how you memorize the sine and cosine. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. When you go the, in the other direction, you lose your sine. The derivative of cosine of x is going to be sine of x plus c. There's a pattern for this stuff. And the rest of these guys are actually your derivative formulas written in reverse. Remember, the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x. Therefore, the integral of secant squared of x dx is tangent of x plus c. And the rest of them work very similar. But at the end of the day, this is calculus 2. Stare at it, look at it, feel good about it, memorize it, we're going to move on. Okay? This is what we do in calculus 2 because this is a wee bit of a review from what we did in calculus 1. Other properties of integrals. This first one we talked about in the last section, the integral from A to B, these are guys with bounds, these are definite integrals. The integral from A to B of a constant, K dx, is equal to the constant times B minus A. When you integrate a function f of x plus or minus g of x dx, then you integrate the first function, integral from A to B of f of x dx, plus or minus the integral of the second function, f of, uh, integral from A to B of g of x dx. Constants, when you integrate with a constant, out a constant, you get to pull the constant out front. So the integral from a to b of a constant times f of x dx is equal to the constant times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. You're focusing on the function with the variable in it, constants just hold over. They hold out front. This is one of our other properties we talked about last time, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. If I want to switch the bounds, that's, you have to negate, negate it. So that would be negative the integral from b to a of f of x dx. Another property is this. The integral from uh, a to b of f of x dx, if that happens to be equal to zero, if a equals b. That integral equals zero if a equals b. And the reason for that is if you integrate from a to a of any function, I don't care what the function is, the integral is the area under the curve. If you only go, instead of over an interval, you go over a single point, a to a, how much area is there under a dot? Under a dot, it's all length but no width. So because of that no width, the answer is zero. There's your reasoning behind it. Okay? And here's some of that piece, of pu piece puzzle type stuff here. The integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from b to c of f of x dx is equal to, well, it's the same function, f of x dx, but you're basically finding the area from a to b and then from b to c. That's the same thing as finding the area from a to c of f of x dx. So you can put integrals together. As long as it's the same function, if you integrate from a to b and then from b to c, that's the same thing as the integral from a to c of f of x dx. And if you can put them together, you can also take them apart. The integral from a to c of f of x dx minus the integral from b to c of f of x dx equals the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Basically, putting the pieces of the puzzle together and removing them. Another note is the integral from a to b of f of x dx is greater than or equal to zero, which means the area under the curve of f of x dx from a to b is greater than or equal to zero, which is positive area under the curve if f of x is greater than zero. A function being greater than zero means it is actually located above the x-axis, okay? And also, uh, a is less than or equal to x, which is less than b. a is on the low end, b is on the upper end. Similarly, the integral from a to b of f of x dx is greater than or equal to the integral from a to b of g of x dx if, if you got more area under this dude than you do this dude, and remember it's the same bounds from a to b, then f of x has to be greater than or equal to g of x, a.k.a. f of x is on top of or greater than g of x, and also a is less than x, which is less than b. A, always, when you integrate, you want the lower number on the lower integrand and the bigger number on the upper integrand. So, let's practice some integral problems. Here's one right here. I want you to integrate. Again, this is really using our... Chapter 4.9 skills, because this is what we did in Chapter 4.9. Notice there's no bounds on this guy. I want you to integrate 3x squared plus 2dx. Well, according, and I'm only going to write this out one time, because after a while I'm going to catch a pattern and do it a little quicker. But since I am adding two functions that are being, and I want to integrate them, that's the same thing as integrating the first guy plus integrating the second guy. 3 is a constant, so it goes out front. So this is 3 times integral of x squared dx plus the integral of 2 dx. And then I apply my properties. This will be 3 
the integral of x squared, that's that famous power rule, x to the n dx, add 1 over add 1, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Uh, adding 1 to 2 is 3, so it'll be x cubed over 3, plus integral of constant, that was that rule I just gave you guys, integral of constant is the, the constant times, in this case, x being the variable. And officially, I get a plus c for integrating this guy, I get a plus c for integrating this guy, but a constant plus a constant is a one big constant. And we don't write multiple c's, we just write one big plus c. And then the last thing I do is clean it up and make it look good for an answer. The threes cancel here. The answer is x cubed plus 2x. Because we have no bounds, we put plus c. <clears throat> you can always double check your answers. If I take the derivative of my antiderivative I just did, I should get the original problem back. The derivative of x cubed uh, plus 2x is 3x squared plus 2. And the derivative of a constant is 0. That's why that thing just doesn't show up here. So there it is. So you can always double check your answer by taking the derivative of your answer, and it should be back to your question. So let's take a look at the next guy. When I'm going to integrate, I'm going to look at each term and make sure it's in cleaned up form. This one's pretty nice here, so this one I can straight up do. The integral of 3x to the fourth minus 7 over x plus 4e to the x minus 5 sine of x plus 3 dx. Each one of these guys is a formula that I have memorized. And now I'm going to do it a little bit quicker because I'm, I'm not going to just write down integral to each one of these guys, which is what I'm doing, but I'm just going to save myself, in my case, some ink. For you, in your case, some pencil lead here. I'm just going to integrate each term. Constants do what? Look at that first term, 3x to the fourth. Constant holds over. What is the integral of x to the fourth? Add 1 over add 1, you get x to the fifth over 5 minus 7 is a constant. Constants hold over. This is the function 1 over x if you just leave off that minus 7. The integral of 1 over x, by definition, is the natural log absolute value of x that we have memorized. Plus, 4 is a constant. Leave it alone. This is one of your favorite rules. What's the integral of e to the x? It's its own derivative. It's its own integral as well. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The integral of e to the x is e to the x. Minus 5 is a constant. Leave it alone. What is the integral of sine of x? And this is how I have memorized. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. Therefore, what's the integral of sine of x? Negative cosine of x. Plus, integral of a constant, 3 in this case, dx is just 3 constant times x. And then each time I integrate, I get a big old plus c constant and add them all together, one big plus c. And so the last thing I'm going to do is clean this thing up. So the answer is 3 fifths x to the fifth minus 7 natural log absolute value of x plus 4 e to the x plus 5 cosine of x. Negative 5 times a negative cosine of x is plus 5 cosine of x plus 3x plus c. And there's my solution. But that one was the nice one. Take a look at this problem. The integral of 3x squared plus 1 over x minus 6 over x squared plus the square root of x plus secant of x times tangent of x plus 2dx. Before you integrate, clean him up. And you're cleaning him up to make him look like a rule that you have memorized. This is calculus 2. These are the rules we have memorized. They're the derivative rules in reverse. That's where these rules came from if you remember your section 4.9 lecture. So... I'm going to rewrite this problem. This is the integral. 3x squared is good to go. I can integrate that guy. Plus 1 over x is a rule I have memorized, so I'm going to leave him alone. But the next guy, minus 6 over x squared. Anytime I have a fraction where I have x to a power, as long as it's not x by himself. x by himself is a rule I have memorized. But any other power, I don't like stuff on the bottom with powers. I'm going to bring him to the top and make the exponent negative. So this will be minus 6x to the negative 2. Plus, I don't do square roots. I don't do radicals either. Square root of x is also known as x to the one-half power. Plus, now look at secant of x times tangent of x. That is a rule I have memorized, so I can integrate that guy. So that'll be plus 6 secant of x times tangent of x. Plus 2 is a constant. I can integrate that dx. So first thing I'm going to do to any kind of function before I integrate him is clean him up to, the, to make him look like a formula I have memorized. And then if I'm adding or subtracting a bunch of functions, I integrate each function and add or subtract them. So 3 is a constant. Leave it alone. Integral x squared is add 1 over add 1. 
that'll be x cubed over 3, plus the integral of 1 over x, dx is what? Natural log absolute value of x. Minus 6 is a constant, leave them alone. This is x to the negative 2. I don't care what the power is. x to a power, you add 1 over add 1. That'll be x to the add 1, which will be negative 1 over negative 1. Same idea with x to the 1 half power. So it's a crappy fraction. Who cares? x to a power, you add 1 over add 1. Adding 1 to a half is 3 halves. That'd be x to the 3 halves over 3 halves. Plus 6 is a constant. It holds over. This is a rule I have memorized. What is the integral of secant of x times tangent of x? Secant of x. Plus the integral of 2 with respect to x would be 2x. And then each time I integrate, I put one big old plus c to collect all my plus c's that I added for each term I integrated. And now the last thing you're going to do is clean them up one more time. Here the threes cancel, so I'm left with x cubed plus the natural log absolute value of x. Negative 6 divided by negative 1 becomes a plus 6. x to the negative 1, negative exponent goes back where it came from on the bottom. That becomes x to the first. When you divide by a fraction, invert and multiply, that'll be time plus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves, plus 6 secant of x, plus 2x, plus c. And there is my solution. So notice something, brother, in terms of integral calculus. And this is something that's going to haunt you for a very, very long time until you graduate and then graduate school for some of you people. First thing I did was algebra. Then I applied my calculus, and then I did more algebra. So there, for every line of calculus I'm doing, I'm doing at least two or three lines of algebra. And that's the basic ratio. Okay? Look at the next one. Well, he switched up the letters on you. The integral of 3t squared plus 7t plus 5 divided by the square root of t. Notice something or other. In terms of these 14 rules you have memorized, and they're over here actually, the 14 rules you have memorized, these are all you know. So, if it is not one of these rules, you're going to have to turn it into one of these rules. Which means, if you look at these rules, there is no product rule. That was only with derivatives. There's no quotient rule. There's no chain rule. There's only 14 rules you have memorized. So if it's not, if you've if you got a quotient or you got a, a product or something like that, what you're going to have to do first is clean them up. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I don't do square roots. A square root is a half a power. So this is 3t squared plus 7t plus 5 divided by t square root. That means t to the 1 half power dt. And since I'm dividing it by a single term, I can clean this guy up by putting that single term in the denominator under each term in the numerator. So that becomes 3t squared divided by t to the half plus 7t divided by t to the 1 half plus 5 divided by t to the 1 half dt. Now cleaning them up, this is equal to the integral of 3. When you divide, you subtract the exponents. Uh, t squared divided by t to the half is t to the 3 halves plus 7. t officially to the first divided by t to the half. When you divide, subtract out expo exponents. 1 minus a half is a half. So that's t to the 1 half. And stuff on the bottom. I don't like things on the bottom of powers. I'll bring them to the top and make the exponent negative. That would be plus 5t to the negative 1 half dt. Look at this. Three lines of algebra and I yet have to do any calculus. Now apply your calculus. 3 is a constant, leave them alone. Integrate t to a power, add 1 over add 1. That'll be t to the adding 1 to 3 halves gives you 5 halves over 5 halves. Plus 7, t to the 1 half, add 1. That'll be t to the uh, 3 halves. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves over 3 halves. Plus 5, integrate t to the negative 1 half. The constant holds over. Adding t to the negative 1 half, adding 1 to that makes it t to the positive 1 half over one half, and then one big old plus C. So there's my calculus line right there, and then I gotta clean them up by cleaning up my algebra once again. When I divide by a fraction, I invert and multiply. So I end up getting, flipping it up, two times three is six fifths, T to the five halves, plus flipping, dividing by three halves, same thing, multiplying by two thirds, two times seven is 14. So this is 14 thirds, 
t to the 3 halves plus dividing by a half invert multiply b times 2 5 times 2 is 10 t to the 1 half plus c and there's my solution but what if we put bounds on it so all these other problems I've just done is exactly the same kind of problems I did in chapter 4.9. That's a big review right there. But just to remind you, because Christmas and we had a month off, so there we go. So here we go. The integral from 0 to 2 of 3x squared plus 2dx. I want you to integrate this guy. This one's with bounds. This is how you do your work with bounds. This is equal to... First thing you want to do is integrate it. But because it's got bounds, you don't put plus C. 3 is a constant. Leave it alone. The integral of x squared is add 1 over add 1. That'll be x cubed over 3 plus integral of 2 with respect to x is 2x. And I'm done integrating it. No plus Cs. Because you got bounds, it's replace the plus C. You put a bracket and you put your bounds from 0 to 2. This lets the mathematician know you've already integrated it. And now I'm waiting for the evaluation. So I've integrated my function. Here the threes cancel. You can go ahead and clean up the algebra a little bit. But it's x cubed plus 2x evaluated from, and you read it from bottom to top, from 0 to 2. This is that fundamental theorem of calculus we were talking about. You plug in top minus plug in bottom. Plugging in top, this would give you 2 cubed plus 2 times 2 minus plugging in bottom. 0 cubed plus 2 times 0. And I want you to see that plug in top into my function, plugging in 2, minus plugging in 0. And notice the wonderful use of parentheses around this thing. Let's clean them up. This is equal to 2 cubed is 8, plus 2 times 2 is 4, minus 0 cubed plus 2 times 0, and 0 plus 0, that's still 0. So the answer is four, uh, 8 plus 4, which is 12. And there's your answer. I just wanted to show you guys something rather. Remember section 5.2. We've done this problem before. We did this problem in the 17th century kind of way. It was the exact same problem when I showed you guys this Riemann algebra. The integral from 0 to 2 of 3x squared plus 2dx. We used Riemann sums and the properties of summation and a whole page of work. And what do we get for the answer down here? It's 12. And that's the beauty of math. You can do it the hard way, you can do it the easy way, but the answer is still 12. We don't do it the 17th century way anymore. We use integral calculus to do this kind of problem. And notice how few lines I had to be able to do this particular problem and stuff. Okay? So, just something worth noting in, in terms of looking at this particular problem and how much, quote unquote, quote, time you have saved by actually understanding how to use this antiderivative that was discovered, which is this interval calculus. On this problem, we have an issue, and that is when I integrate, sometimes I can get a negative answer. And since this integral is supposed to represent this area under the curve, how does it equate to having a negative answer when I integrate and, and that idea of area? Well, here's the idea. When you integrate and you get a positive answer, that means that area is above the x-axis. If you integrate where the function is actually located below the x-axis, that means your region is below the x-axis. And when your region is below the x-axis, that when you integrate, that area will be deemed as quote-unquote negative. So... If I'm looking at this particular problem right here, and it's hard to see on my uh, dark screen here, but this is uh, A right there. This is region A. This is region C. You'll notice something rather here. That my function dips below the x-axis, above the x-axis, and below the x-axis. So and let's say this was a negative 4, and this is positive 4 over here. So when I integrate from negative 4 to positive 4 of f of x dx, this function between negative 4 and wherever this point happens to be over here, the function dip below the x-axis. Here's your x-axis right here. If it dip below the x-axis, that little region of area between that curve back to the x-axis is going to be negative. So whatever area this is, it will be negative area.
plus, now between this point and this point, the function was above the x-axis, and that's a positive area, so that's going to be a plus a b area, positive area, plus, now we're back to below the x-axis for this region c down here of area, so that's going to be a minus c, because any time the area is below the x-axis, we be deemed that as negative. So when you integrate, if you look at this thing right here, if you look at this guy from a math perspective, this is negative a, whatever a is a area number there, plus b minus c. I had a question for you. What kind of resultant answer do you expect? Look at these regions of areas. Is it going to be a positive number answer? Is it going to be a negative number answer? Or is it going to be a zero answer? What do you think this problem is? Negative. It's negative. I got more negative area than I got positive area, so my net result, this answer is going to be negative. But you can have answers of negative. You can have answers of positive. I can integrate some bunch of stuff and get an answer of zero. You can get all kinds of different answers when you integrate. But here's the geometric representation of this stuff. This idea of when I integrate this area between the curve back to the x-axis, if the curve happens to be located below the x-axis, you are going to get a negative answer out of this guy. It's going to be a negative area. Okay? So based upon that, this problem here, and again, we're supposed to use uh, 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 basically geometry to do this problem. We're supposed to find the integral between 0 and 3 of f of x dx, okay? Using geometry. Well, here's my function. It was nice. They gave me a nice straight line. Here is 0 and here's 3. When I integrate a function, it's giving me the area between that function back to the x-axis. Here is my x-axis. So between negative 1 and, oh, this is 0 here, between 0 and 1, this is a little bit of negative area. It's a little triangle there. And then I pick it up the rest of the way, and now the function's above the x-axis. It's going to be positive area. You with me? Now, the area of this is a triangle, so the area is equal to 1 half base times height. The base is 1, the height is 1, so this will be 1 half times 1 times 1, which will be 1 half. Does that make sense? But it is located below the x-axis which means this region would be considered to be what? Negative. Here is your area 2 over here, and again, it's a triangle, which is one half, area is 1 half base times height. This will be 1 half. The base from, two, from 1 to 3 is 2. The height is actually, this is 0, up to the y-coordinate, uh, this is 2, so the height would be 2. And 1 half of 2 is 1 times 2 is 2. And this area is located above the x-axis, so it's positive. So the answer to my problem is going to be negative 1 half for this negative region here, plus 2. Negative 1 half plus 2 is 1 and a half or 3 halves. That'll be my answer. Looking at it from a geometry perspective and noticing that anytime I got area captured below the x-axis, the integral is going to evaluate that as a negative area. So, here's the problem right here. You are supposed to find the total, read your words, because this is the kind of words we're going to throw at you guys, find the total shaded area of the graph relative to the function f of x is the sine of x. So here's my function, f of x, which is equal to the sine of x, and we're looking at between 0, in case you can't see your numbers out here, to 2 pi, one complete cycle of the sine function from 0 to 2 pi, okay? Because here's the deal. If you did this, well, I want to find area, I'm going to integrate the function sine of x dx between 0 and 2 pi, well, it would be interesting what you get for your answer if you do it this way, because you're going to get the wrong answer. Because if you integrate this guy, help me out here, see if you got it memorized yet. What's the integral of sine of x? Negative cosine of x, evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, Fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom, negative cosine of 2 pi minus negative the cosine of 0. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be negative the cosine of 2 pi is 1 minus negative the cosine of 0 is 1. This is negative 1 plus 1, uh, 0. The integral from 0 to 2 pi is 0. Does that mean there's no area in this guy? No, that is not what it means. It means your negative area has canceled with your positive area, and you've got a net result of uh, nothing, zero. You've got no area there, okay? 
believe the net area, the negative area, has canceled with the positive area. Their question was this. Find the total shaded area. There are two shaded regions here. So what you should do is use symmetry. So to get this total shaded area, you should find one of the shaded areas, and that would actually be the integral from 0 right here in the middle is pi. I would integrate from 0 to pi of the function sine of x dx. Now that would give me just this region. But because of symmetry, this region is equal to this region. So to get the total shaded region, what do I got to do? Just double it. Use symmetry. To find one of the regions. And then once you get that answer, you just double it for the other region. And that will give me my total answer. So here we go. This will be two times the integral of sine of x. Again, is still negative cosine of x. Evaluated from 0 to pi. So this will be two times... Plug fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be negative the cosine of pi minus negative the cosine of zero. That'll be two times negative the cosine of pi, knowing your unit circle, a prerequisite to actually get into college, um, is the cosine of pi is over there 180 degrees is negative one, things we have memorized, minus negative the cosine of zero is positive 1. So you end up getting 2 times a negative negative 1 is 1 minus a negative. Minus a negative is back to plus 1. So this is 2 times 2. So the answer is 4 and they want area so that would be a unit squared of area. But the answer is 4. This actual region is 2. This one is 2 as well. It's negative 2 from an integral perspective because the area is captured below the x-axis. But being a shaded region, we want the total. means we, we, don't, we don't want the negatives canceled with the positives. This is going to be 2. That's 2. The whole answer is 4. So that's the answer we're looking for. It's 4 square units. So in terms of web work on this particular section here, Look at this guy here. This is the integral of 9e to the u plus 1 du. I don't care what the letter is. It can be e to the x, e to the t, e to the u. The only formula I have memorized is the integral e to the x dx. That's e to the x plus c. It doesn't matter what the letter is. The integral e to the u du is e to the u plus c. But I've got 9 times e to the u plus 1. So what you're going to have to do here is clean them up. This is the integral of 9. e to the u plus 1 is e to the u times e. That's officially e to the first power, because when you multiply, you add exponents. I'm just pulling off the part I don't need. So this is just algebra uh, times du. Constants go out front, so the 9e is 2.71828. It's a constant. Pull them out front. Times the integral of e to the u du. So 9e is a constant. Integral e to the u is e to the u plus c. And there's my answer, but if you really want to, you can put them back together again and get it 9e to the u plus 1 plus c. Either way you want it. So how can we mess you up in this particular section of web work and doing uh, algebra problems and stuff? Look at the next guy. The integral of the 5 sine of t divided by 1 minus sine squared of t dt. This is not a rule I have memorized. I only got 14 of them memorized, and this ain't one of them. But I happen to notice something or other. 1 minus sine squared t. What is that equal to? That's called a Pythagorean identity. You should know this. Cosine squared t plus sine squared t is equal to what? 1. And then you can manipulate this guy. This also means that 1 minus sine squared t by moving the sine to the other side, it's going to be equal to cosine squared t. It's a Pythagorean identity. So I can do some trig algebra to clean this up. So this is the integral of 5 sine of t divided by cosine squared of t. That's still not a rule I have memorized, <laughs> but wait. What does cosine squared really mean? To square something or other means multiplying by himself. So this is equal to 5 sine of t divided by the cosine of t times a cosine of t, dt. 
What is sine over cosine? Also known as, because we know trig, because we had to pass it in high school. What is sine over cosine? Tangent. So this is the integral of 5 times the tangent of t. And this officially times 1. What's 1 over cosine also known as? Secant. That's right. Secant of t. 1 over cosine is secant of t. So with the algebra trig maneuver of knowing my trig and, and equivalent functions, this thing turned into 5 times a tangent of t times a secant of t dt. So I want to integrate 5 tangent of t times secant of t. This is a rule I have memorized. 5 is a constant. What is the integral of tangent of t times secant of t? The same thing as secant of t times tangent of t. Integral of secant of t times tangent of t is secant of t plus c. There's your answer. And notice how I had to manipulate it through Pythagorean identities and knowing some trig facts. Sine over cosine is tangent. 1 over cosine is secant. 1 over uh, sine is cosecant, just to let you guys know about it. Okay? Some other problems we can do. The velocity of a function uh, is v of t equals t squared minus 6t plus 8. They gave me the velocity function. For a particle moving along a line, find the displacement and the distance traveled by the particle during the uh, interval uh, 0 to 5. All right, and we try to give you guys some formula hints here. Displacement is basically just integrating with your bounds from 0 to 5 of, of, of your velocity. Your total distance traveled is the integral from 0 to 5 of the absolute value of v of t, dt. Absolute value of the velocity versus integrating the velocity. What's the difference? When I ask you what is displacement, if I start here at the podium and I go 5 feet to the right and then I turn around and go to 7 feet to the left, my displacement is negative two feet or two feet to the left of where I started from. Displacement is where am I relative to where I started from? That is displacement. With displacement, you want the negatives to cancel with the positives to show what the end result is. But if I do total distance, if I went five feet to the right and I went seven feet to the left, the total distance that I traveled was, well, five plus seven is 12 feet. I don't want the negatives to cancel with the positives. To make sure the negatives don't cancel with the positives, we do this absolute value around it. We don't have to know how to integrate absolute value. No, what you're going to do is you're going to separate the negative regions from the positive regions and make everybody positive in terms of when you integrate, get all positive answers, and then add, add up all your positive answers. That's the trick. So here we go. For displacement. This is equal to the integral of your velocity, dt. From, in this case, it's from 0 to 5. This would be the integral from 0 to 5 of t squared minus 6t plus 8 dt. That'll be equal to t cubed over 3 minus, what's the integral of t? I'm going to start doing some math a little bit quicker here. Integral of t is t to the first, add 1 over add 1. That'll be t squared over 2, right? But 2 goes into 6 three times. That'll be minus 3 t squared. We do expect you to be able to do math in your head here. Plus, integral 8 is 8t, evaluated from 0 to 5. Fundamental theorem of calculus, plug in top minus plug in bottom. This will be 5 cubed over 3 minus 3 times 5 squared plus 8 times 5. Minus, now here's another trick I'm showing you guys. Mentally, plug in 0. 0 cubed divided by 3, 0 squared, 8 times 0, 0 minus 0 plus 0. Eh, that's just zero. No reason to write zero in everything. It's zero. You can do that kind of math in your head. So, here we go. Five cubed divided by five minus three times five squared plus eight times five and minus zero. I get a negative ten. That is my displacement. If this was measured in feet, it would be negative 10 or negative 10 feet to the left. What is it? Yes, question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There's my typo. I thought it was a typo in there. Thank you. It's 5 cubed. Oh, how about 6.6667? That's even better. 6.66667 or 6 and 2 thirds or uh, what is that? Uh, 20 thirds. Uh, feet, miles, whatever it happens to be. Thank you. I thought that was... I have to be careful on my uh, typing 
things into the calculator. So watch the careless errors on the calculator there. But does it make sense though? That's your displacement. Does that mean I own the, the total distance I covered was uh, six and two thirds feet? No. What it means is when I go left and go right, everything's canceling. So at the end of the day, I'm right because it's positive six and two thirds feet or miles or whatever to the right of where I started from. Now, here's the other one. In terms of uh, total distance, you got to integrate from zero to five of the absolute value of V of T dt. This would be integral from zero to five of absolute value of T squared minus six T plus eight dt. Now, this is the trick right here. This will be equal to, how do I integrate an absolute value? You don't. What you do is you graph the function. You're going to separate the negative regions from the positive regions. So I'm going to type in x squared minus 6x plus 8. And I'm going to hit my window here. And I'm just going to put in, all I care about is between 0 and 5. And I'm going to do a zoom fit, zoom 0, fits the screen. So this will be from 0 to 5, and this is my region. Okay, so I'm going to draw that guy over here. It looks like this. And if you look at your numbers, here is zero. Here was two. Here is four, and here is five. Just kind of show you on the cal calculator here. I'm looking at my, there's zero, there's one, two, three, four, five. So we hit it two, and we hit it four. So here's the deal. You're going to break this thing up. This is the integral from 0 to 2 of t squared minus 6t plus 8 dt. And what kind of answer, if I just integrate from 0 to 2, am I going to get? I'm going to get this region, which is above the x-axis, is positive, right? So you can stick absolute values around it, but they're not going to mean absolutely nothing because the absolute value of a positive is positive. Plus, now I'm going to pick it up and that rest from 2 to 4, of t squared minus 6t plus 8 dt. But when I integrate from 2 to 4, what kind of answer am I going to get? Negative. With total distance or total area, we don't want the negatives to cancel with the positives. So it's important to put the absolute value around this guy and make him positive. And then plus the rest of the way, the integral between uh, uh, 4 to 5 of t squared minus 6t plus 8 dt. And this, again, will be positive because it's above the x-axis over here. So putting absolute values around it won't matter. So here you're going to integrate. This will be t cubed over 3 minus 3t three squared plus 8t, evaluated from 0 to 2, plus absolute value of this t cubed over 3 minus 3t three squared plus 8t, evaluated from 2 to 4. But that's going to be a negative number when I'm done, plus... Uh, the t cubed over 3 minus 3t three squared plus 8 evaluated from 4 to 5. That's positive, so you don't have to put the absolute value around it. So fundamental theorem, plug in top minus plug in bottom. So when I plug into this thing here, okay, when I plug in, this will be 2 cubed over 3 minus 3 times 2 squared plus 8 times 2 minus 0. This gives me, I did it on my calculator, 6.6667 for that part. Plus, when I integrate this guy, this will be your 4 cubed over 3 minus 3 times 4 squared um, plus 8 times 4 minus plugging in 2, which is your 6.6667. Just save myself some time. Fundamental theorem, third plug in top minus plug in bottom. You're going to get a negative answer here. And that negative answer is going to be negative 1.33333. But we're taking the absolute value of that. That's going to be positive. Plus, when I do this last little part here, I'm going to plug in 5. That'll be 5 cubed over 3 minus 3 times 5 squared plus 8 times 5. Okay. Okay. Uh, minus zero, and I end up getting a, uh, when I plug in five here, so I can calculate. plug in top minus plug in bottom, plugging in four into this thing. I'm running out of room here. So plugging in four, 
I end up getting a positive 1.33333. So what is my resultant answer? It is going to be 6.66667 plus, this is going to be a positive 1.33333 plus another positive 1.33333. What do I end up getting? 9.33333, that is the resultant answer. 9.33333 uh, feet, units, whatever it happens to be. That would have been actually your total distance. Does that make sense? Questions? So, again, this is not hard stuff, but the difference between displacement and distance. We've got a couple more problems to do, but we'll finish these up next time and then move on into section uh, 5.4. Uh, so see you guys then.